So item number 15 on today's calendar is Senate Bill 417 Sub A, also by Chairman McKinney, an act relating to Waters and Navigation Coastal Resource Management Council. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, given the length of the calendar, I'll keep my remarks as short as I can. This bill will clarify Rhode Islanders' uh, constitutional rights to access the shore. As you know, our Rhode Island Constitution provides that every Rhode Island citizen is entitled to enjoy the privileges of the shore, uh, and this bill will determine that uh, the rights uh, therein can be exercised up to 10 feet landward of the recognizable high tide line, which is usual, as is known as the rack line or the seaweed line. Uh, the bill also provides any number of protections, including uh, improved protection against liability by any nearby homeowners. Uh, it, it clarifies where one cannot go on the shore. You can't go up on seawalls or lawns uh, uh, and, and that type of thing. Uh, the importance of this act is that there has not uh, been previous uh, action by the General Assembly to determine exactly where the shore privileges can be accessed and enjoyed. Uh, and so there was a 1982 case that made that attempt. Uh, unfortunately, their uh, effort has turned out to be essentially unworkable. And so uh, at the time, 40 years ago, they suggested that they were acting in the absence of action being taken by the General Assembly. We're a little bit later than perhaps had been planned, but we are finally taking action. Uh, the, uh, the act also has been improved. The bill's been improved from what we originally provided by the House in that we have included provisions that would make sure that signage on the shore, which is frequently uh, not legal, is, is indeed correct. And so there will be work with the Attorney General's office to get that accomplished. And it also makes sure that with respect to uh, education of the public and the property owners, uh, the uh, uh, CRMC will work to make sure that that is better so that people do understand exactly what their rights and privileges are. Uh, with all that said, this is a good bill, and I move passage. Chairman McKinney moves passage of the act. A seconded by Senator Oyer, Senator Felag, uh, Senator Sosnowski, uh, Senator Mario, uh, Senator Mack, uh, Senator Gu, uh, Senator Lawson, uh, Senator Coleman, Senator Cano. Uh, Senator Burke, Senator Bell, uh, Senator LaMountain, uh, Senator Loria, uh, Senator Ujafusa, Senator Murray, Senator Casada, and Senator Valverde. Discussion on the act. Senator Gu. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll keep my re remarks brief. Uh, I want to thank Chairman McKinney, as well as the you, Mr. President, and Leah Pearson for bringing this vote, um, bringing this bill to a vote. Um, this bill means a lot to our shoreline communities and really any Rhode Islander who's trying to access our state's 400 miles of shoreline. Um, some property owners think that they own the land and some think also the sea in front of their house, that their property rights are subject to a common law known as the public trust doctrine, which generally says that certain natural resources, including the sea and submersible lands, are kept in trust for the public benefit and cannot be sold or privately owned. This bill uses that principle of private public trust and defines the public private boundary as the recognizable high water mark. Often that's the seaweed line plus 10 feet. And if there's no seaweed line, then it is the boundary between the wet and dry sand plus 10 feet. And this ensures that uh, no matter where the water is on any given day, the public and the people will always have room to exercise their constitutionally given rights to the shore. I think this bill is a really positive first step and uh, once we pass it, I think we need to continue public education about the issue, and I appreciate Chairman McKinney's also including public education and outreach to make sure that the public and property own owners understand the bill and um, are able to exercise their rights. Uh, thank you, Senator Goo. Further discussion, Senator Zuria. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, in my opinion, there's much to recommend for S-417A. We Rhode Islanders have a constitutional right to shoreline access, and the current definition of that, as stated in the Ibbotson case, has proven to be unworkable. As a result, legislation is needed, and there is a reasonable basis on which to justify the standard articulated in this bill. On the other hand, the landowners who oppose this bill claim it ex exceeds the General Assembly's legal authority, and they promise to challenge it in court. To put it another way, the issues involved in this bill will take us into legally uncharted waters, and it is quite possible that the litigation that results will prove to be no day at the beach. In light of this, I believe that prudence and caution would be better served if the bill included an effective date 
that is one year out into the future rather than have it take immediate effect. That would allow the parties a window of time in which to seek and hopefully obtain judicial guidance concerning the proper balance between the public's right to shoreline access and the property rights of the owners of land bordering on the ocean. My concern is that if we pass this law and it immediately goes into effect upon the governor's signature, then the aggrieved landowners, if they win their case in part or in whole, will have a claim for damages against the state. In contrast, if the court resolves the case before the law goes into effect and the outcome is not what we desire, there will be no claim for damages. It also is possible that we will end up in a similar posture under the current structure of the bill. More specifically, the landowners may go to court right away and seek a preliminary injunction alleging that their constitutional rights are at risk should the court fail to enjoin the law from taking effect. If the court grants such an injunction, then the operation of the law may be suspended until it is resolved in the courts. On the other hand, the opponents might not seek such an injunction or the court might deny one that is requested, but nevertheless ultimately rule in favor of the landowners in whole or in part when the case is finally adjudicated. Let me be clear. I support the principles of this bill and have for a long time. Back in 1990, when I was an assistant attorney general um, in the Environmental Protection Division of the state of Massachusetts, I filed this amicus brief in support of the issue of shoreline access rights in the Bay State. Um, I look forward to voting in favor of this bill, given that the current standard needs to change. There's a reasonable legal basis for this bill, and it is my hope that it overcomes the expected legal challenges. The possible scenarios I just sketched out could well prove to be incorrect, as capable attorneys on both sides map out their strategies. When all is said and done, however, this bill includes an immediate effective date because we, uh, I regret that this bill includes an immediate effective date because we cannot predict with certainty how it will fare in the courts and we are not giving ourselves a window of time to allow the courts to sort it out. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Zuria. Senator Bell. Uh, thank you so much. And I rise in strong support of this legislation. And I want to thank the sponsor for his uh, work on this important bill. Um, I think that, you know, I would have preferred the boldest original version here, but the current language I think is still quite solid and allows us to really preserve constitutional rights. These are ancient constitutional rights in Rhode Island dating back to our original charter codified especially strongly in the Constitutional Convention during the 80s. These are really important rights and I think the legal basis that people use to argue is a lot sketchier than they present. The argument has to do with the nodal cycle of the moon and arguing that you have to measure a property line over 18 years. And so therefore it's too time intensive. And so people rely on a property line that was measured many, many years ago, but with coastal erosion and mild sea level rise, uh, oftentimes that property line uh, is underwater when based on this old mean high tide line. The legal basis is extremely weak, uh, especially in contrast with Rhode Island's basic uh, constitutional rights. I think that this is legally sound. I think it should stand up. I certainly hope it stands. I think the legal basis is robust. And I also think it's going to be a good thing to have it come into effect initially because I think some people's fears of the vast dangers that are going to happen are overblown and actually having it come into effect may demonstrate to some people that it's actually not quite as bad as they're fearing to be able to have a few people walk, walking along what had been their private corner of the beach. Uh, thank you, Senator Bell. Further discussion? Hearing none, the clerk will please unlock the machine. If all members have recorded their vote, the clerk will lock the machine with 31 votes in the affirmative, three in the negative, and the act passes. Item number 18, Senate Bill 729 by Senator Mack, an act relating to state affairs and government, lead hazard mitigation. Senator Mack. 
Thank you, Mr. President. The purpose of this bill is to provide tenants with um, legal recourse if they have uh, lead inside their units. Earlier this week, the AG made a historic move to um, file a complaint against Pioneer Investments and the landlord, Anarag Sarek, after five uh, young people over the past five years have been found with lead poisoning in several of those units. Um, this would create a procedure for uh, tenants to be able to put their rent into a um, court approved account um, and I move passage and at the appropriate time I also have an amendment. Senator Mack moves the act. A seconded by uh, Senator Lawson, Senator Mario, Senator Sosnowski, Senator Oya, Senator Coleman, uh, Senator Cano, uh, Senator Miller, uh, Senator McKinney, uh, Senator Bell, uh, Senator Valverde, uh, Senator Casada, Senator Murray, uh, Senator Uchafusa, and Senator Loria. Uh, Senator, would you like to offer your amendment at this time? Yes, Mr. President, I would like to move amendment LC002542-2. Senator Mack, office LC002542-2. Seconded by Senator Oyo. On the amendment. Oh, can, can Would I you explain? like to elaborate on the amendment? Yes, this amendment clarifies the process by which the rent can be deposited with the courts in response to a rental unit being out of compliance with the Lead Hazard Mitigation Act. Uh, changes were made in, coordinate, um, in coordination with the courts and the AG's office. Senator Mack moves the amendment. She already moved the amendment. I'm sorry she gave the explanation. Is there discussion on the amendment? Hearing none, the clerk will please unlock the machine. If all members have cast their vote on the amendment, the clerk will lock the machine with 30 votes in the affirmative, three in the negative, and the amendment passes. Senator Mack moves the act as amended. Seconded by Senator Oya, Senator Lamountain, Senator Murray, Senator Lombardi, Senator Gu, Senator Felag. Discussion on the act as amended. The clerk will please unlock the machine. If all members have recorded their vote, the clerk will lock the machine with 29 votes in the affirmative, five in the negative, and the act as amended passes. Item number 19 is by Senator Lawson, Senate Bill 739, an act relating to state affairs and government, lead hazard mitigation. Senator Lawson. Thank you, Mr. President. Members of the Senate, this bill too is put in at the request of the Attorney General's office. It would allow for a property owner who fails to comply with lead hazard mitigation provisions to be subject to damages and reasonable attorney's fees, and I move passage. Senator Lawson moves passage. Seconded by uh, Senator Oya, Senator Coleman, Senator Lombardi, uh, Senator Mack, uh, Senator DeMario, uh, Senator Murray, Senator Valverde, Senator Loria, Senator Ujafusa, Senator Bell, uh, Senator Burke, uh, Senator McKinney, and Senator Cano. Is there discussion on the act before us? Clerk will please unlock the machine. If all members have recorded their vote, the clerk will lock the machine. There are 34 votes in the affirmative, none negative, and the act passes. Next item is also by Senator Lawson, Senate Bill 742 Sub A, an act relating to elections, State Board of Elections. Senator Lawson. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. This bill was put in at the request of the Secretary of State. It would designate a liaison position within the Secretary of State's office. It would be either the Director of Elections or the Deputy Secretary of State who oversees the Elections Division. And this liaison would formulate communication between the Department of State and the Board of Elections and would add accessible voting devices to the equipment maintained by the Secretary of State. And I move passage. Senator Lawson moves passage. Seconded by Senator Burke, Senator Oya, Senator Cano, Senator Loria, Senator Lamountain, uh, Senator Zuria, uh, Senator Lombardi, and Senator DeMario. On the act. Clerk will please unlock the machine. If all members have cast their vote, the clerk will lock the machine. There are 34 votes in the affirmative, none in the negative, and the act passes. Item number 21 is by Chairwoman Oya, Senate Bill 804, an act relating to the property, residential landlord, and tenant act. Madam Chair. 
Thank you, Mr. President. This is the third bill in the Attorney General's um, lead package to help um, provide enforceability mechanisms to the existing lead laws. Um, lead paint uh, stopped being manufactured in 1978. It's 2023. Um, and yet about 14% of Newport children are lead poisoned by the time they reach elementary school. That's just Newport. We have numbers across the state. Right now, the lead um, mechanisms in place only allow action after a child is lead poisoned. These bills, and this bill in particular, will help the preventative efforts by creating a mechanism through the Department of Health to be able to register these properties, allow, um, and then prevent uh, the um, prevent the um, landlords from avoiding getting these lead certificates. I also want to point out that we're not actually requiring in these bills any additional requirements under the law. We're just requiring enforcement mechanisms. Additionally, there is millions of dollars of state and federal funding available for anybody who needs help mitigating lead on their property, including um, tax credit programs in the state of Rhode Island. Um, with that, I move passage and I have a floor amendment at the appropriate time. Chairman Oyo moves passage of the act. Seconded by uh, Senator Felix, Senator Palmer, uh, Senator Coleman, Senator Cano, uh, Senator McKinney, uh, Senator Bell, Senator Burke, uh, Senator Valverde, Senator Murray, Senator Loria, uh, Senator Uchafusa, Senator Lamountain, uh, Senator Mack, Senator DeMario, uh, Senator Zuri, and Senator Lawson. Would you like to offer your amendment at this point in time, Madam Chair? Uh, yes, Mr. President. I move LC002544-2. Chairman Oyer moves amendment LC002544-2. Seconded by Senator Felag, Senator Laurie, Senator Burke. On the amendment, would you like to elaborate on the amendment, Madam Chair? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. This just clarifies that in the registry, um, we're looking for the contact information, both for the landlord as well as if there's a property management uh, company. When it was originally drafted, I think uh, Ledge Council thought that it was a duplicate, so we just kind of fixed that. So it's not a typo. We want the information from both the landlord as well as the property management company. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Is there a discussion on the amendment? Chairwoman Sosnowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, would the sponsor yield? Will the sponsor yield? I believe she will. Is this on the amendment or the bill? That's on the bill. So I'll wait. Yeah. Okay. On the act? Okay. <laughs> we are on the amendment. Uh, discussion on the amendment. Hearing none, the clerk will please unlock the machine. If all members have cast their vote on the amendment, the clerk will lock the machine. There are 30 votes in the affirmative, four in the negative. <laughs> And the act passes. Senator Oya moves the act as amended. Seconded by uh, Senator Palmer, Senator Bell, Senator Lamountain. Senator Sosnowski. Now, if the, uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, if the chair would yield. I just had a couple of questions. In the legislation, it says there are some um, exemptions to this. Um, I was just wondering if you could clarify the exemptions to the legislation, and also how would um, a landlord, uh, for instance, know that they're supposed to be complying with this registry? Um, thank you for those questions. So right now, um, there is currently a lead registry that exists in the Department of Health, which um, it captures almost all of this information. However, the way that the registry works is incredibly unwieldy, and it's not searchable by property address. It's not searchable. So this is really just um, intended to provide um, kind of a consolidated enforcement mechanism for um, different areas of law. So there's also another law that requires um, property owners, landlords to give contact information to the tenants. However, that's not necessarily the information that goes into the lead certificate database that, that currently exists. So the exemptions exist because um, this doesn't apply to properties after. The, the lead paint was um, 1978. So, okay. thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Sosnowski. Senator Bell. Uh, I just want to quickly uh, thank uh, the sponsor for all of her work on this legislation. I think uh, it's gotten to a really uh, great place. It's made a lot of improvements, and I think it'll really help address a really serious public policy problem in our state. Thank you, Senator Bell. Further discussion on the act is amended. 
Clerk will please unlock the machine. If all members have cast their vote, the clerk will lock the machine to a 29 votes in the affirmative five and the negative, and the act passes.